Hello, and welcome to the Project Good podcast. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Hilton. Project Good is a social impact podcast interviewing experts and advocates about the pressing problems that we face globally and hearing how they suggest we move forward in the future. The Project Good podcast is brought to you by Project Good Work. The goal of this podcast is to inspire people and organizations to develop a mindset that can move others to positive action regarding the complex social issues facing people and the planet. For March, we're focusing on the complexities of relational conflict. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Famika Grant, who holds a master's degree in counseling and is a certified personal coach. She is passionate about helping others reclaim, renew, and redefine their lives. She focuses on helping others recover from underlying effects of past trauma, usually stemming from childhood wounding or adult life exposure to narcissistic abuse. Ms. Grant is highly relatable since she is a mom and wife and focuses on helping others find healing and recovery from emotional abuse. Let's get into the interview. Today, we will be meeting with Famika Grant, who inspires women of all ages to overcome past setbacks through reframing negative thought patterns and imparting the understanding of how to acquire, take back, and step into their personal power to overcome codependency issues, stop people pleasing, learning to set boundaries, finally learning to say no, and developing self-compassion. She reminds women that saying yes to self is not selfishness. Ms. Grant will soon be releasing two books. The first is the Inspirational Self-Compassion Journal, which is a journal created to inspire personal growth and increase self-love. The second book is called Her Story, Unbreakable Stories. Every woman has a story, which is a series of stories written by teen girls, young women, and seasoned women, showcasing profound stories of trauma and inspiration. Welcome, Ms. Grant. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast. Um, so before we get started, I always like to ask um, people why they do what they do. So what inspired you to become a personal life coach or a life coach? I viewed life coaching once I found out what life coaching was really all about in comparison with being a counselor. Life coaching appealed to me because it's a process that helps people move forward. So it kind of moves them out of the past. Whereas counseling, you kind of dwell a lot on past issues. I think it's okay to acknowledge past issues and to deal with them. But life coaching offers the opportunity for others to move forward and also to the, to develop vision for their future. So if they're stuck in a place, it helps them to get unstuck. It also focuses on a discovery process where it's not like I'm the big guru who's giving my clients the answers. They're actually a part of the discovery process. And I like that type of synergy of being able to kind of create, um, you know, to help them create and discover their path or their journey um, together. It's not like a solo thing where it's the big me and the small you as the client. It's both people working together, but the client is actually doing a lot of self-discovery. Yes. And I, you know, I, I never even thought of um, life coaching in, in that sense that it's uh, kind of um, you're working together versus if you go to just see a therapist, a lot of times when you do go to uh, see a therapist, it's just you sitting there and somebody like, uh, you know, um, telling you what uh, they think or, uh, or sometimes just listening to you. So it's, uh, you know, um, a lot of times just uh, one direction versus uh, I guess you would say in life coach taking action, which is uh, I guess where you would say the results happen. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, wonderful. Um, so my first question for you in, uh, talking about, um, relational complexities right now, um, one of the reasons I wanted to even discuss this topic is that I feel, uh, especially during this time of, uh, the, uh, pandemic and all these changes that we're seeing in the last few years is that, of course, one of the uh, biggest areas that we see, I think that has hit home for, I think almost probably everybody on this planet is uh, relations between um, uh, human beings and how people are acting um, 
uh, with the people who are close to them, uh, to uh, strangers. We've seen this um, on uh, on the news, unfortunately, of people getting um, angry um, and, uh, you know, acting uh, crazy, I'll just say, <laughs> uh, crazy <laughs> and un- unruly <laughs> yes. out here, um, you know. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the frustration um, is uh, uh, building in all different ways. Um, you know, I think uh, for a lot of people, um, you know, we always knew that uh, there are people out there that um, have uh, uh, difficulties um, dealing with uh, just people in an everyday life. But I think now this has touched uh, each person, even people that didn't normally have uh, relational uh, conflicts. And so I wanted to first address uh, how people are feeling. So what would you say are the two greatest emotions people are experiencing during these times? I would have to think right now with the state of the affairs of how things are going um, on a you know, a nationwide level, I think two of the greatest emotions people are feeling right now is frustration and anger. Mm-hmm. A lot of people. And I guess, can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit on the frustration and anger? Sure. I feel that people, certainly people are feeling a sense of frustration and that frustration and anger is leading to different types of manifestations like anxieties. Um, Anger may be due to a feeling of powerlessness to change a situation. If we look at the way our social lives are being structured around the pandemic with people being locked you know, being on lockdown or certain privileges being taken away, which you were once accustomed to just a normalcy of interacting with family, friends, society. Now everything is being changed. Um, There's actually just a, seems like a reset of how we even view, we're viewing our personal lives. Um, A lot of us are rethinking our futures. There's been a lot of loss, loss of lives. There's been a lot of loss of security. There's a lot of unrest in our own personal lives that is registering in our society as frustration, anger, feelings of powerlessness. Things are changing so rapidly, but a lot of people feel powerless to change their personal situation, whether that's due to job loss, the loss of a loved one, isolation, um, uncertainty, um, all of these emotions can eventually lead to things like anxiety, depression. Uh, it can create a situation where violence is on the rise because sometimes some people who are unstable, they may tend to see violence as a way of lashing out or a way of, you know, unleashing this violent energy that, that, that has been, it's like, it, it, I would compare it to having a pot that's on a stove. If you keep turning up the power and turning up the fire, eventually that pot or that kettle is going to boil over. And this is what is happening in the lives of some people, lives of a lot of people. Yeah. Do you, th- do you think that we are being led to conflict and anger in society? I think in some ways we are being influenced um, to handle things through anger and conflict because we see leadership in our nation. There's so much conflict in politics. There's so much conflict being also conflict is glamorized on television. People feed into Mm -hmm. conflict as a source of entertainment. And that's very, um, concerning that now conflict, you know, we see a lot of reality shows glamorizing conflict glamorizing anger as a way, as a norm. And I think I I tend to think that if you have a society that glamorizes or glorifies uh, this type of toxic behavior, then eventually that is going to spew out onto society itself. And people are going to start taking on those norms. You have to remember, we have a lot of people in our society. It's not just the young people, it's the older people too. When you start watching the movies, if you go to the movie houses or you watch stuff on television, it's riddled with conflict, it's riddled with behavior that used to be deemed unacceptable, but it's now acceptable and it's even glamorized. Hmm. This is true. Uh, this is uh, definitely true. I guess one of the um, the biggest things that um, is, uh, you know, getting a, a spotlight 
um, uh, recently, but I think it's been, of course, for a few years, but uh, just because I think we've had uh, some time in these last uh, few years to really look at things. Um, in uh, what ways would you say uh, technology, because that's one of the things that people keep uh, pointing to, has improved or ruined relationships? Oh, technology is like a, a two-edged sword. On one hand, technology can be very useful and helpful in bringing people together. Um, thank God for Zoom during the time when we all were on lockdowns or separating from one another. We were able to communicate and come together through Zoom. It's not the real thing, but it was a good alternative. On the other hand, where you have all these social media platforms where people are just lashing out and using social media as a way to um, vent their anger, vent their point of view, even if their point of view is hurtful to another. This is what's happening in our society. Uh, social media is separating us because, I mean, how many times do you go to a restaurant and you see people with their children. What are the children doing? What are the adults doing? It seems like everybody's on their phone these days. Instead of actively engaging with one another, it's almost like technology has taken the place of the human element. And that's, that is very concerning, beyond concerning. That's scary. When people sit down to eat, it's like, it's not the way it used to be. Either the television is on or somebody's fiddling with the phone and I think that has created a huge distraction in human beings coming together to communicate, coming together to uh, come to a consensus of how to just dwell together and be together without having the technology become a distraction to bonding relationships. Yes, it's funny that you bring that up. I actually was reading an article um about uh, from a, a P, uh, Pew Research, excuse me, a Pew Research uh, study about um, how uh, technology and social media and relationships, um, how they're um, intersecting. And it was actually 51% uh, of people felt that uh, their um, significant other or um, uh, or a person or a partner that they were with uh, had more relationship <laughs> with the phone <laughs> than, than them, and that's horrible. Mm -hmm. More than half, more than half of the people uh, 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 felt that way, and so you know. Um, Obviously, uh, when somebody's not uh, paying attention to you, it's hard to have a relationship. So, what are some? Um, uh, I want to get more uh, personal and relatable for people. So, what would you say are the causes of relational conflict? Oh, there, there are so many causes of relational conflict, but I would say probably right at the top of the causes of relational conflict is money. Finances are definitely uh, a huge cause of relational conflict. Um, there are other issues like communication, a lack of communication, lack of understanding. Um, when you don't communicate, how can you understand people's point of view or be open to understanding their point of view? So where there's no communication, it's like a leg of a table. Imagine if finances was one of the legs. Communication was uh, one of the other parts of that table, that leg is gone. Finances is a problem. Another part of conflict is that uh, people are very self-absorbed uh, and materialistic. And when people are self-absorbed and materialistic, it doesn't leave room to really um, engage in having respect and compassion for your fellow man. Because we live in a society that is driven by images and once again, depicting and glamorizing the materialistic lifestyle. And that also takes away from the human element of just learning how to dwell and be with one another and have a respect for our fellow man. We live in a society that is so driven by media consumption, driven by um, getting more, gaining more. And that becomes a source of relational conflict. Um, also the fact that it doesn't seem like there's a huge drive to keep the family together because now we see so many lifestyles being depicted on television that are not family oriented, 
So there's not a whole lot that's moving towards building family, building powerful communities. We don't see those images. They're far and few in between. There's rarely a time I can even turn on the television and watch it with my my child. I really have to sift through what we're watching. So if that's the case, that tells me that based on what's being shown on television and social media is basically driving society towards becoming more materialistic or society is already there. It's not necessarily driving anymore. Society is already there. Everybody's trying to grow. Um, It's okay to grow financially, but when your whole mindset becomes, how can I get rich? I want to be like the rich and famous. I don't think that's healthy for any type of relationship. And so those are the key, key things that I can think of that finances are driving a wedge in relationships, lack of finances. The wealth gap is driving a wedge in between relationships where you see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you want to jump in there. No, I was just I was just agreeing. Um, but I also wanted to ask, do you think that it has just become harder in general to maintain relationships in modern times, um, not only just because of what we're seeing on media, but just because of the time period that we're in? I definitely think that it's harder to maintain healthy relationships because of the time period that we're in. It's like all these it's like the perfect storm. So much is happening at once. And everything that's happening is pulling at the fibers of healthy relationship and tearing us apart. So, yes, it is becoming more difficult for a culmination of reasons. The time period we're in, social media, uh, Mm -hmm. the fact that there is a a pandemic on the rise. All of mm-hmm. these are, are all of these, if you could look at them, they're layers and layers that has caused more and more division and separation among human beings. And these things are definitely re- uh, reflected in how we treat one another. It's reflecting in, in our daily lives is being reflected in basically the, you know, the workplace is being reflected in, how people just are not the way that they once were. Society is definitely changing and has changed. That's a, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I obviously, you know, being as a, another fellow human on the planet, have seen um, changes um, uh, during the uh, pandemic and, you know, um, and, you know, I have my own personal thoughts of how people are changing when I just uh, <laughs> interact and relate to them. Um, how would you, I guess, um, say, uh, just for some people, I guess, um, not to, I guess I, I'm trying to find the correct word for people who are maybe not uh, as tuned in um, to uh, others, um, in the last couple of years, um, how do you think that uh, people have uh, began to see themselves? Um, because I think, uh, you know, uh, for these changes um, to be happening that um, are noticeable, that people have to be seeing themselves uh, differently. Yeah, I think that people are seeing themselves differently. I think that some are coming, um, some of us are coming in contact with our own mortality because there's been so much death around us Um, since 2020. That's the conversation, you know, at the dinner table, that's the conversation on the news. It's been about the pandemic, the death toll on the rise. Many of us have lost loved ones or have been affected by sickness ourselves. So I definitely think that we are considering our mortality, our, our time here on this planet. And, So whereas in the past, maybe that was taken for granted. And now I'm sure many of us hopefully are not taking that for granted anymore and are beginning to make decisions based on the length of time we may or may not have on this planet. So I'm I'm hoping that people are really looking at their mortality in terms of living out the rest of their lives in a way that is impactful to others, respectful to others, and most of all, using their time wisely to pay attention to 
all that's going on in our society and how not to, um, to allow that to affect their quality of life here on earth. It's difficult as it is, but <laughs> really to try to maintain a high standard of, of values and high standard of uh, family unity as well as community. And we're doing that during a time where those things are, seem to be unraveling. But it's just very important to focus on what's important and family is important. Um, faith your faith is important. That's one thing that people steer away from the conversation about faith because it seems to be some unspoken rule that people don't really, I don't really hear too many people publicly speaking about faith anymore. I mean, I don't know this is what. True. Yeah, I mm -hmm. don't, I could not have made it this far without faith, faith in God. And I don't hear what people are talking about that anymore. It's almost like an unspoken thing, like, oh, don't talk about God. Don't talk about your faith in God. Well, I think that's so important, having a church community, if you're a part of one, if you, know, if you have one, to stay close to that community, stay close to uh, family members if you can't get to see them. Um, make an effort, to a diligent effort to reach out and stay connected. It's so important that we stay connected with one another. I can't emphasize that enough. That yes. human, yeah, that we stay connected to friends, families, our children, spend time listening and communicating and getting in one another's heads to find out what's really going on so that we can work towards rebuilding a respectful and safe community, even if it happens one household at a time. But we have to start. We can't depend on government and we can't depend on anyone else to do something that we should be doing as as individuals it has to start with each one of us to you know rebuild the communication the loss of of relational dynamics has to change and go in the direction of safety and it has to go in the direction of health you know being healthy having a healthy communication healthy relationship and all this toxic type of dynamics that's being depicted you know, on television or played out in our society, I just want to make sure personally I'm not contributing to that. So I am doing a lot of soul searching and looking at ways like how have I contributed to anything that has caused a toxic environment? Because we do get influenced by what we see, what we hear, even we, we may not even be aware of it. But this stuff that's going on around us influences, you know, influences our behavior. And so to combat that, we do need to strengthen uh, relations that are healthy ones. And if they're not healthy, we have to do our part in contributing to the health of one another, the well-being of one another. Yes, I 110% I agree with everything that you have said. Um, uh, one of the, um, you know, just to kind of go into looking at where we are um, as a society, one of the things that I was reading in a study was um, uh, from uh, uh, University of San Diego, um, is that uh, narcissism is on the rise, um, this, uh, you know, um, uh, self-absorption. And I think uh, we definitely would have to, or we have to confront that um, in order to um, be able to start, uh, you know, healing, healing relationships. Um, so I guess, uh, do you see, I guess, the same thing? Do you feel that uh, uh, self-absorption and narcissism is on the rise? And then if so, um, why do you feel that it's on the rise? My answer is an absolute and emphatic yes. Um, Self-absorption self and narcissism is on the rise. I believe it's on the rise because there's a widespread consumption, once again, of um, negative, um, just negative influences coming from social media and the glorification and glamour, just glamorizing and rewarding self-absorbed individuals. And when I say rewarding them, I mean these individuals, whether they're uh, 
celebrities or people on television, um, reality TV shows, what have you, they're rewarded through more media exposure, which means they stay in the public eye. This leads to more interest of them on our part as a society, which leads to more media consumption by the public. It's like a vicious Mm -hmm. cycle. Yeah. And this is how this behavior is not only being depicted and played out through the different venues, whether it's TV, social media, you know, it's how this perception of someone who is very toxic and television on television and saying, Oh, look how bad these people are. Look how toxic they are. Or, but, but they keep them in the media. That's the problem. They keep them in the media and everybody like a herd of cattle goes running to listen or hear about this particular person or these people. And we just keep consuming and recycling more and more of this information throughout our society. Whereas if, if it was, Mm -hmm. you know, if we were to depict this behavior as being wrong, we don't reward it with more exposure, (laughs) but it's actually being rewarded with more exposure, more money. They throw more money at it. They get more people who have this self-absorbed demeanor, self, self-absorbed attitude, narcissistic attitude. Narcissism, I think, is actually a quality that is useful for television ratings and popularity this day and age. Yes. You know, as you were, as you were talking, it got me to thinking that, um, uh, as I was thinking about television and social media, and then of course um, the last uh, years before the um, uh, pandemic, what we were seeing on on the television a lot, um, I have started to realize maybe um, that we're all living uh, stereotypes, maybe. we're living yeah like uh uh, you know the more you were talking i was like it's almost like we have become we're not we've lost our humanity um we're not becoming we're not individuals anymore because we are all trying to fit into um you know this uh stereotype that has been uh you know uh pushed on us um through media and um you know um and I guess uh, you can say uh, the people we encounter now because they've been in, influenced. Um, so, yeah, you were uh, what you said just started to really open my eyes there that, uh, you know, we are losing our individuality. Um, and I think people aren't seeing that that is um, the effect um, of all these things that we've been seeing. And um, and that's, you know, scary because that's the thing that makes us human. Absolutely. Um, yes. yes. And so one of the things that I also wanted to discuss, um, just for, uh, uh, people out there that are, of course, experiencing, um, uh, relationship, uh, um, you know, um, conflicts and, um, you know, um, and, and fallouts, uh, whether it be with, a you know, sibling, a husband, a partner, um, I wanted to uh, ask you, um, since you have the uh, expertise of what type of relationships um, do you feel that uh, people experience the greatest conflict? Do you see it more in like sibling relationships, family relationships, um, you know, uh, marriages? Um, Is there, I guess, is there a relationship that experiences more conflicts than others? Well, there used to be a time when I'm sure that people would say yes, <laughs> but I think those days are long gone. There is so much conflict in so many different types of relationships in marriages, uh, conflicts in the family between siblings, between parents and adult children, between parents and smaller children. Um, there's conflict in the workplace. There's conflict between neighbors. There's just, it's like we live in a society where there's ongoing conflict. Like when you watch the news, I watched a news story the other day. It's talking about the increase of conflict on airplanes. And that's a step. <laughs> yes. like, I can't all believe about? we've right? come to that. We've come to that. <laughs> yes, so we have an article <laughs> conflict on airplanes. <laughs> conflict on air- you, you can't, people are not being civil 
when they're like <laughs> 20,000 <laughs> feet above air for an hour. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very scary because there's nowhere to go. <laughs> I know, there's nowhere to go. I mean, I yes. saw this story the other day on the news where someone, some guy was trying to open the door of the aircraft. I'm like, that is really <laughs> scary, you know? <laughs> there's civil unrest on airplanes, for God's sake. It's like... So it's no longer just, oh, marriages, it's just conflict in marriages. No, there's conflict and unrest in every facet of relationships. Like I said, parent, child, neighbors, uh, siblings. I mean, I, I can't count the number of people I've talked to who have loved ones who they just don't talk to each other anymore. There's no, I mean, even though there wasn't any type of fallout, it's just that they grew apart and it just seems like people, they're becoming less loving and less um, less considerate. And mm -hmm. I almost, I'm cautious to say this because I don't want to pass, uh, I don't want to use a broad stroke over all of society, but these things are becoming so prevalent that it's not uncommon. I hear the same stories over and over and over about family members who just, do not communicate, do not come together. And it's almost like they're not even family anymore. So I think family dynamics have changed for many. Um, marriages are suffering. Um, in the workplace where people are physically working together, not for those, of course, who are working at home, but when they do come <laughs> back together, there's conflict on the job with your fellow man. Um, a lot of this, and I won't get into anything political, but, you know, there's even unrest with people who share differences in their political views. It just seems to me like we are a nation divided, honestly speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through and through, yeah. from the top to the bottom. Yes. Um, and one of the, you know, classic uh, relationships that, you know, most people think of when they hear about relational conflict is our marriages, of course. Um, so one of the things that I noticed during my research is that uh, the pandemic caused a serious uh, spike in divorce and uh, breakups. Uh, why do you think that that happened? I think that happened due to, number one, we were all so isolated. We were told to, you mm -hmm. know, you go to the store, stay six feet apart, wear your mask. So you didn't, people didn't really have an outlet. They, they had to dwell together and be together constantly, whether they wanted to or not. And I think that level of isolation really was like putting the top, the lid on a boiling pot, <laughs> because maybe what some of these people found out is that they really did not have the love and have the long suffering that it took to hold a marriage together. A lot of people were dwelling together and some found that they didn't like or love the other person and felt like they wanted out of the marriage. Or people just found that they had a different lifestyle that they wanted to pursue. And sadly enough, Divorce was their way out. They no longer wanted to, you know, a long time ago, I believe people just, you know, believed in staying together so they could raise their children and weather the storms together. And in this case, some people just viewed marriage like, you know, uh, I can finally get out of this because Maybe family for some is not at the top of the list of things that people stick around to cultivate. And so I just think that the isolation brought about some dynamics in the home where people are no longer willing to tolerate one another any longer. I'll just put it plainly. People are not willing to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Other uh, one another stuff anymore, whereas marriage is about um, learning to develop tolerance and learning how, you know, marriage, like anything else, you have to keep, you know, you have to tweak a lot of things along the way. Because if you think of marriage, if you're in a long term marriage, for those of us that have been married a long time ago, if you're in a marriage for 10 or 15, some for 20, you have to 
think about the fact that you're no longer the person you were 15 years ago or 20 years ago. You're not even the person you were 10 years ago. So for people to be in a marriage and, you know, have these feelings like you're not the person I married, of course, they're not the person you married. It's like 10 and 20 (laughs) years later. It's like two and three and maybe four children later. (laughs) So nobody's who, you know, none of us are the person that originally got married. Yeah, no, when I look in the mirror, I'm like, what happened? (laughs) Yeah, you know, know, if you've had children, you know, you, Mm -hmm. you change. You know, time brings about a change in all of us. You know, some of us are, are, you know, better at defying, you know, gravity and defying. (laughs) Yes. We go through mental cycles, we go through developmental changes. There are stages of life, you know, we all go through stages of life and we're changing as individuals. And when you're married, you have to be accommodating to the change that each, each person is having as an individual. And that's what marriage is. And when people are intolerant of that, the marriage falls apart. And so I think, like I said, the isolation of the people being being more uh, being isolated and having to stay together and realizing that they're not willing to tolerate one another anymore. And that caused a huge spike of of divorce in society. Mm -hmm. Just a lack of tolerance. Yes. Yes. That yep. was, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And that's the perfect word. That's the, that is the perfect word. Um, what would you say are the best way, ways uh, to deal with uh, conflict in relationships? I think that one of the best ways at the top of the list is always going to be keeping the lines of communication open and being willing to address issues with tact, but do address them during the inception phase, meaning don't wait to, for conflict to be allowed to fester or if there are bruised emotions, um, when people get their emotions bruised, if those uh, emotions go unacknowledged, it's going to eventually build up a hidden resentment. And that resentment is not going to be hidden forever. <laughs> eventually it's going to spew out. So I would say keep the lines of communication open. Um, Try to cultivate that communication in a way that's respectful and transparent. I would say it's very important to set proper boundaries. Uh, if some people deal with issues of people pleasing and they don't set pro- proper boundaries and they're always willing to say yes, yes to, to the other person's opinion, they're going to feel a sense of resentment because they're going to feel like they're not being acknowledged, they're not being valued, they're not being heard. So it's important to let your boundaries. Uh, be known. We all have um, a boundary line somewhere within us. So we have to let that be known because we can't take it for granted that the other person is simply going to know what our boundary is. They're not going to know unless we tell them. So keeping the lines of communication open, being transparent, making it known what your expectations are. That goes in, in line with what I was speaking about boundaries. Let the other person know what you're expecting out of them. People can't be to us what they don't know we're needing at that moment. But if we let them know that we're expecting something out of them, I'm expecting you to call at a certain time. I'm expecting that if you're late to, you know, just acknowledge that you were late or whatever it is that we need out of that person, let that person know. Um, And definitely not allowing ill feelings to begin to fester when left unattended attend to feelings right at the inception stage. If there's a friction in that relationship, is there some type of um, feelings of, you know, something is, is not right. The conversation didn't go just right. Don't just walk away from the communication table and throw your hands up and say, Oh, I'm done because those feelings left unattended, they're just going to turn into bitterness and resentment. So deal with them openly and honestly, and be willing to share what your expectations are and be willing to listen. That's so important. We have, you know, that's a main thing when people are not willing to listen to another person, they're just so close minded. They think they're right. It's so important that when we do communicate that we come to the table with an open ear to hear what the other person 
is needing from us, not only being willing to divulge what we need, but willing to be a part of the process. Because communication is like breathing. You know, one is inhaling, the other is exhaling, and then you take turns. And so that's what keeps a relationship alive. The communication is like, to me, I see it as breathing. Somebody's inhaling, somebody's exhaling, then you give the other person. It's like sharing air, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's your turn to get some air so you can stay alive. <laughs> and now here you take, you know. <laughs> yes. So you just, you know, that's what relationship is. That's what healthy relationship is. You're helping one another. You're giving one another the uh, permission to breathe. And everybody mm -hmm. needs space to just simply breathe. We're going through so much this day and age. And that is just, I can't say it enough. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Keep the lines of communication open. Set proper boundaries. Make your expectations known. And you'll be on your way to a healthier relationship. Yes, wonderful. I, I love that because, yeah, yes, that communication is air and that boundaries are key. Um, those are definitely things that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, even from a personal uh, aspect that I've had to work on and definitely things that I've seen in other uh, people's relationships um, that uh, have been uh, successful that I see, you know, they, they communicate uh, very well and uh, they know when to say stop. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard for some of us to say no. Mm -hmm. I want one of those people mm -hmm. I've had to, that's been a struggle of mine throughout my life because through the type of parenting I received, you know, my generation, you know, it's like, oh, be a good girl. You know, you don't create friction. You don't, you know, I was taught in some way, I wasn't literally taught don't say no, but in mm -hmm. some way, the type of parenting transferred over onto me, like somehow no became wrong. And so as an adult, I have a difficult time saying no. And I have to realize, and there are many people who have the same struggle. No is not a dirty word. You have to say no. You know, imagine if you never said no to your children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably would have jumped oh off goodness. a cliff right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and there are some people you have to say, some adults you have to say no to because it's just like the child. If you don't say no to them, oh my goodness, if you can imagine what your house would look like, what your life would look like, <laughs> but some people in your life, they're the same way. And no is like a, a fence. You wouldn't look at a fence as bad or dirty. You need a fence, you know? <laughs> a fence sets a boundary line. So a no is the same thing. A no is not something bad or wrong or dirty. A no is... If you put a no in place to either protect yourself or a no is just out of an honest place. You may want to protect your time. You're valuing your time. You're valuing something. Or you may not feel like doing something or you may not be qualified to do something. But no is not a dirty word. If you have to use the word no, use it skillfully, respectfully, but do use it. There are times you have to say no for your own sanity, you know? Yes. 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 And then, uh, you know, and here's the ultimate question. Um, you know, nobody, of course, wants to uh, ever do this, but sometimes it is better. So when do you know it's better to end a relationship? I think when people get to the place where you know you're not being valued or respected in a relationship, and I don't ever advocate for divorce. Mm -hmm. I'm not an advocate of divorce. But I am an advocate for people separating. When you are in a relationship where you're not being valued or respected, if you're in a situation where you're being taken for granted, you're not being acknowledged, um, not in just the ways that you want to, but in a way that's just out of human decency. You know, there's a level of respect we have even for people that we don't even know. You know, strangers, when we go to the grocery store, we have a certain level of courtesy and respect. And when you're not just getting that res that human courtesy and respect from that person, where you're not being valued, where your time is not being valued, where you're being walked all over financially, nothing about your life or what you have brought to the table in terms of who you are as an individual is being acknowledged or valued. And that's been ongoing and consistent and it has become chronic. You need to step back and you need to start considering a way out. Mm -hmm. 
Pretty That's, much. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I won't even talk about, I won't even go to the level of physical violence. Yeah, I think that's, it, that's yes. a definite, that's a given. You need to go. That's a yeah. given. You yes, need yes, because you might that's not happen- make it. <laughs> you might not make it. So if that's happening, yes. I don't really have that many words. I just say go. Go. But <laughs> yes, for, yes. Yeah, where the lines mm-hmm. are blurred. I don't know. Um, nothing's really violent. Well, it doesn't have to be violence. It could just be that you're not being acknowledged. You're not being respected. Your time is not being respected. Your finances are not being respected. You're making up excuses for the person. And you've been making up excuses for a very long time. And you're at this end point and you realize I'm at an impasse. What do I do? You're at the fork of the road and you're tired of making up excuses. Because when you're with somebody and it's time to go, usually what happens to you is you begin to feel drained. The person is no longer making deposits into your well-being. They're actually making withdrawals. They're taking away from you as a person. And you know you feel drained and you feel exhausted in just trying to make this relationship work. You need to step back and look, examine that and realize that it's probably time for you to walk away. Yes. Yeah. And that leads me to my next question. I think this is a an important one that I think everyone needs on the entire planet. It's simple, but it's very important. What is a true friend? Yes. A true friend is somebody who is willing to listen. I always go back to communication. A true friend is somebody who is not only willing to listen, But a true friend is someone who is also willing to give positive feedback, even if that feedback may not be what you want to hear. Because I always view friendships and life and relationships is to me, it's like as if you're driving, you're the you're in the driver's seat. But sometimes, well, I live in a in the country, so to speak. So if my passenger, they may be able to see like, oh, there's a horse and I can't see it because I'm driving. But that person is able to see our blind spots and a true friend is able to divulge to you what your blind spots are if you have them and you're able to um, receive, I mentioned healthy deposits, is somebody who's willing to deposit into your life from a perspective that is from a place of care, from a place of respect, and from a place of honor. A true friend is somebody who honors you for who you are. You don't have to dim yourself down or dumb yourself down in the presence of a true friend. The true friend is able to see the good, bad, and the ugly about us and still be there in our life while we're on the journey of transformation and on the journey just simply called life. So a true friend is somebody who will love you at all times, even when you're not at your best. And not being at your best may be that you're going through something in your life, a separation, a death, a loss. And you may be broken because of some of the things going on in your life. It just doesn't have to be the ugly parts of who we are. Maybe I need to change in this area. It could have been something that affected you in your life. And that true friend is there with you while you're going through that stage. And they don't leave you or abandon the relationship. So I see that as a true friend. Somebody who's there for the long haul and they're not a patsy. They're not somebody that allows you to just, you know, walk all over them. They're willing to tell you what they see about you. They're willing to tell you where you need uh, constructive criticism. They're willing to give you that constructive criticism. But at the same time, they're willing to praise those areas of your life where you need to have praise, where you need to have acknowledgement and affirmation. And most of all, they're willing to stay on the journey with you and not abandon the relationship during difficult times. Yes. And that's, I believe finding a true friend is hard to do um, these days. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I would would agree. Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, especially yes, especially with the you know with uh, you know with this uh, uh, rise of self-absorption and narcissism, um, you know it's hard to um, 
especially, you know, I'm of course not an expert in narcissism, but when, what I know is that uh, narcissists can sometimes, you know, um, uh, pretend to be, you know, uh, concerned about you, but they're really not. <laughs> yes, that's true. And so, and so that's, you know, it makes it hard sometimes to find a, uh, a, a true friend um, because uh, you really have to uh, get to know someone um, before, you know, disclosing uh, your life to them. Yes, that's a very good point. Yes, you definitely have to get to know them. And, you know, if somebody comes right off the bat in the relationship and they're doing something which is called love bombing, that's what narcissists do. Like from the inception of knowing you, they just smother you with, oh, I love you. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. Well, <laughs> Uh, I think you better watch that kind of behavior because true friendships aren't necessarily developed like that. True friendships are mainly forged in the fire, really. It takes time to, you have to get to know a person. You have to spend time with them. You have to, um, you know, have some dealings with them, a lot of experience um, with them. And it's through, like I said, true friendships are forged in the fire. It's not the beginning stages where a person is like, oh, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. You have to watch that because that's how narcissists um, creep into your life. They come with praise immediately. They're praising you. And if you have a real deep need to constantly receive praise or you have insecurities, or if you're just a, a compassionate person, any of those things, a narcissist can uh, pick up on that and quickly um, take advantage of your vulnerabilities. So do watch for those things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, one of the things, I just have two more questions for you. Um, one of the things that I think that a lot of people are uh, seeking right now um, is to uh, find inner peace. Um, so how do people find inner peace during these times? Well, I think during these times when uh, people are pulling away and doing a lot of introspective soul searching, um, I know for me, finding inner peace had to do with making peace with, with myself and with God and with things that I cannot change. There are just some things in life that we cannot change. And I find that Dealing with people and dealing with my own inner self, that is oftentimes very difficult for people to simply surrender because we are taught, especially in society, we're hearing a lot. And even I talk about transformation, but there is another facet of helping people to find peace. It's not always through transformation. Sometimes we find p peace through surrender. There are things we cannot change. If, if someone dies, that's something that cannot be changed. If someone doesn't love us, that may change, but it's not something that we should spend all our effort in trying to change another. It's simply learning how to surrender to a process. And when you learn how to surrender to the process, when I say a process, meaning things that are happening in life that are outside of your scope of outside of your ability to change, you have to simply surrender. I think people can find peace through spending more time. I like spending time with nature. I recently went to a farm with my son who I homeschool. Actually, I went a couple of days ago. And I'm not saying everybody mm -hmm. has access to a farm, but if you have access to a park where you could ride a bike, if you have access to where you could, you know, go be near water, there are so many things in nature that has been provided to us that provides so much peace and serenity. Sometimes we have to learn how to also just be alone because we're so used to distraction in today's world. We're so used to the television being on. I know in my household, we're so used to the TV being on. And so many people are saying, I don't know if I'm watching the television or if the television is watching me. <laughs> because you're just so used to, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you're so used to having this, these devices on and all this noise around you. And if you could pull away from that and get back to the basics of reading a book, going outside, walking, calling up a friend. If you have somebody that you can call up, get out there, go bike riding, spend. I like spending time in prayer and meditation. That's very important for me. I set the tone of my day. The first thing I want to do 
is spend time in prayer before my husband and my son wakes up. So that's very important to me. Um, if you're part of a, a congregation where you can, um, you know, get back to um, that congregation where you all have a like mind, uh, like mindedness, where you have people who want to share their belief in God and faith in God. Get back to that. Um, get back to basic things. Start also monitoring the way that you eat. I think it's very important to start caring for yourself. And I say that because, like I mentioned before, the generation that I was raised in, it was like, you know, you cared for others, you served others. And it was almost frowned upon if you, you know, not if you cared for yourself, but if you put an emphasis on loving yourself, caring for yourself. That almost seemed kind of conceited. I'm saying the opposite. It's not conceited to care and love yourself. And so many people have been wounded. That's the problem. You don't have a healthy sense of self-esteem. You may not care for yourself and you need to learn how to care for yourself. Start caring for your health. Start loving yourself and letting go of um, past conflicts. I think forgiveness is also a huge way to find peace. There are some things that, as I mentioned before, I may be uh, redundant in what I'm saying, but it's so important to just surrender certain things. There are certain things we cannot change and we just have to learn how to forgive. And I'm not talking about forgiving. If somebody's abusive, I'm not saying staying with them. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is learning to let go of the anger, learning to let go of the bitterness and learning to move beyond things that we cannot change or things that have happened in our lives. It's learning to just kind of step out of an old garment, so to speak. If you could look at things that are conflict or things that have caused conflict or things that have caused so much hurt in your life, look at forgiveness as if you're taking off an old garment and you're allowing yourself to be freed up to step into a new place in your life. I believe that if you, if some people would just let go of offenses they would find themselves in a place of tremendous peace. And things that give us peace, they're so simple. And in, in, in the meanwhile, there are so many advertisements in helping people to find peace, but you have to spend all this money. You have to run here. You have to run there. Not everybody has all this money to be running here and there. But meanwhile, the things that can give you peace, they're right under your nose. And one of them I've named, I'm being redundant, but I can't say it enough. Get closer to God get closer to the, those that you hold near and dear to you, reinforce those relationships, get close to nature. If you like reading, start reading again, spend time alone. And I want to also mention journaling. <laughs> I didn't mention that. Journaling can definitely help you. It won't, it may not give you the peace that you need, but I think like when you start introspectively looking at things, when you start to write, it just does something for the soul. When you begin to write and you begin to allow yourself to be vulnerable, I think there are some things that you'll find out through your journaling that can lead you to a place of what you need to do to have peace in your life. And also, I think the way you communicate with others can also give you peace. Sometimes the way that we communicate may be through, um, sometimes the way we say things can People are so touchy, and this is why I'm saying this. The way we communicate things, we have to monitor our tone, how we deal with other people. And I think when we begin to deal with other people differently and monitor how we say things to people, meaning that watch how you deal with other people because people are touchy. People are very easy, uh, easily offended. And so when we monitor how we impart words to other people, I think that it will allow us to enter into a place of learning how to resolve conflicts, learning how to de-escalate conflict. It, it happens through the way we communicate. So I think pretty much those are some of the works, some of the works that we can do, some of the ways that we can um, just begin to harness a greater level of peace in our own lives. Yes. Um, I love, I love journaling. So, uh, uh, definitely I'm going to be, um, buying your journal once it, um, becomes, um, open for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
Yes, I, I, I love everything that you have uh, said. And uh, just you saying it made me feel at peace. Because <laughs> 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 um, I was like, yes, I almost was going down through my mental checklist. Like, yes, yes, yes. As uh, you know, as I'm uh, myself, like uh, planning um, my own little uh, self uh, uh, spiritual retreat um, this year. So um, I, 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 I highly suggest everyone um, take a retreat for themselves. Um, and my final question now uh, that uh, I think encompasses uh, our current time period and things that I think, um, I think uh, this is my personal views, but I think that uh, everything in that we started out with 2020 is not by accident. I believe that we are being um, tested uh, globally during this time and sifted to find out what's important to us. Um, so what would you say is the biggest takeaway that we should learn um, about relationships during this time period, during this pandemic? Oh, that's a big one. I would say <laughs> that um, the biggest takeaway that we learn about relationships from this pandemic would be the relationships with we, which we hold like near and dear to us, um, or once held near and dear to us, they're irreplaceable. So we should definitely do our part to make sure that we're living our lives in such a way that emulates those who came before us, meaning those who were in our family that were the glue of our family. I know in my family, we a lot of those people who were the glue, they've passed away. And so we have a generation of people who are not coming together and, you know, creating opportunity to bring the whole family together. So I would say that we have to now step into the role of being the glue, pretty much. And also, we have to start looking at our lives, not only what we can get out of life, how can we benefit? You know, we all, it just seems like we live in a society, the more we get, the more we want as human beings. Everybody wants, it, you know, a bigger house, a bigger this, a bigger that. But it start, it's, it's, it's about starting to look at the benefit of the whole not just ourselves. We have to start caring for the benefit of the whole family. I know we may not be able to supply the needs of our entire family, but what we can do is start looking at ways of how can we keep our family together as a whole? How can we preserve the knowledge of who we are uh, as a people and pass that on to the generations before us so that's not lost? So we won't have a generation that doesn't know who they are. You know, you hear about teenage suicide being on the rise. And I think what's happening is that people who are some people who are millennials may feel like there's nothing left to them. You know, there's no heritage left to them. They can't see uh, they may not be able to see what was left in the world that was passed down to them besides debt, unrest and, and, and the rest. So it's important for each person to do our parts to try to look at the big picture, not just our individual lives and begin to make sacrifices that keeps the family together, that helps to keep marriages together and household together. And look at those who left the lasting and indelible mark on our lives. Who were those that came before us? What did they do? They sacrificed. And in building relationship, building homes, building marriages, that's the number one word. The biggest takeaway is that we have to start making sacrifices and make sure that we're not the people who walk away because we're intolerant of others, especially in our homes. Can't walk away and just leave our children holding the bag. We have to be there for our kids. We have to be there. You know, if you're in a marriage, it may have, you know, some rough patches, but overall it's worth fighting for. If it's not an abusive relationship, it's worth fighting for. We have to get back to the basics of why we were put here on earth in the first place. In the first place. We were not put here so that everybody can be bold and beautiful and rich. We've lost sight of the biggest goal of why we were placed on earth by God in the first place. When I went to that farm, I just want to briefly say, I took notice of how these animals cared for one another. 
And it made me a little bit sad because I felt like, wow, these animals have so much care for one another. And even when I showed up, the dogs, they had like these big Pyrenees dogs. They were just so humble and they just came up to us as if to say they just wanted to get to know us. They were just so, I don't know, welcoming. And I was like, wow, it's amazing how animals instinctively can be that way, dependent on who's the person that is shepherding them or uh, taking care of them. It was amazing that their temperament was such, and it was kind of saddening because I thought about human beings, like what happened to that element in humans where we earnestly begin to care for one another, care for the people who are growing older, care for the little ones who don't know the way. And so I didn't mean to stay on this topic as long as I did, but I would say the biggest takeaway is that we have to look within ourselves and find out not how we can get more, but how can we live a more sacrificial lifestyle? What is it that we can give of ourselves in order to help the younger or the elders um, have an easier and a more meaningful journey in this life? Yeah, perfect. I think that's a perfect way to end um, because I think that's the biggest uh, thing that, you know, that I see um, with the conflict or at least what I've heard in uh, research is sometimes the conflict is not really necessarily with uh, other people or other things. It's really inside of you. <laughs> yes. And so that and that's uh, and that is the, the hardest thing to deal with because uh, you can't get away from yourself. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yes. Um, to, so, yes. <laughs> the yes, hardest you have thing. To learn, yes. And we have to learn how to enjoy our own company and just being, you know, you can't enjoy yes. or love yourself. How is, you know, it's not going to be. How can we expect other people to do what we can't even do within ourselves? How can we expect for other people to be more to us than we are to ourselves? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think that, and that is the, the key, I think. Um, so thank you once again so much for your time. Uh, so thank you, Famika, for your time and insight. If you'd like to learn more about Famika Grant, you can find her on Facebook at Narcissistic Soul Detox or on LinkedIn at www.linkedin.com slash in slash Famika dash G. If you have a passion for an unserved community, a social justice problem, or want to change minds, contact Project Good Work at projectgood.work to start your project of change today. To our listeners, thanks for tuning in to Project Good, where we are focused on what matters. What matters.